Hi, I'm Andy Fingerhut. I'm a principal engineer at Intel Corporation, and I am also the co-chair of the P4 Architecture Working Group with Gordon Brebner. And today I'd like to share with you work that we and the working group members have been working on the past several months and update you on the portable NIC architecture. So several questions I will hope to answer today. Why are we creating a new P4 architecture for NICs? How is PNA different than switch architectures you may be familiar with for uh, defined in P4? What data plane features are we enabling with the PNA that you uh, might not be able to do without a new architecture? When will the PNA spec be ready? And how much do we have left to do? And if you're interested, how could you help? So first, why a new P4 architecture? So NICs have uh, many features that you might want to implement in them that I'll list shortly that are exactly or very similar to what you do in a switch ASIC, but they also have many features that are different. Uh, in particular, many NICs have multiple ethernet ports like switches do, but most packets either start in uh, a host memory or end up in the host memory after arriving from the network. And the NIC has a high bandwidth host memory interface, typically PCI Express in many hardware implementations today. And packets begin being written by host application software, getting to a NIC driver, having a transmit or uh, a transmit descriptor written for it by the NIC driver, um, receive descriptors set up for allocating that have allocated memory, waiting for receive packets to be written there. And these descriptors can point at blocks of host memory much larger than. Uh, an Ethernet jumbo frame even, and so they must be segmented before they can be transmitted on the network. As I mentioned, many of the kinds of features you'd expect to see in a NIC as well as a switch are things like layer two and layer three forwarding, uh, tunnel encapsulation and decapsulation, and QS features like policing, marking, and selecting queues. But there are also many features that are distinctive to NICs, rarely have ever seen in switches, like remote DMA offload, IPsec encryption and decryption, TCP connection tracking, and then TSO, LRO, and RSS are kind of bread and butter NIC features that, that most NICs today need to be implemented to be commercially viable. So we have taken the approach of dividing the PNA definition into two major parts. The first part shown here, uh, we call packet processing. And so the function of this part of the architecture is very much like a switch architecture. It's to process individual ethernet packets or network packets uh, up to one MTU maximum transmission unit in size, 1500 byte ethernet frame or up to a jumbo frame, but not larger. Anything larger would be on the message processing side. So message processing here is shown in hash marks simply because in PNA we've delayed most of our discussion, we've talked a little bit about it, but uh, most of the work in defining it still remains to be done. And uh, it's shown very small in the figure. It will grow larger as we define it more fully, but it's, that's mainly a placeholder showing where it would go relative to packet processing and relative to the host memory there on the right. And so its primary function would be things like, uh, or it, maybe not primary, but it would involve accessing host memory, reading descriptors of various formats, writing descriptors of various formats in host memory, as well as reading and writing packet data in the host memory. And for example, taking large blocks of memory, like 64 kilobytes in the host memory, pointed it by a transmit descriptor and breaking it up into maximum transmission unit size packets with a packet processing port of the NIC to process before they go out. Early on in the work group meetings, we decided to focus uh, first, not only on the packet processing portion of PNA, but also on a few key features that we wanted to be sure that we had the support to enable them uh, in the architecture. And these include uh, act, issues involving the directionality of packets, whether they're host to network or network to host, TCP connection tracking, and IPsec encryption and decryption, with the goal of covering uh, most or all of a uh, feature set like those you'd find in vSwitch. So for directionality, what do we mean here? Uh, I'll start with Imagine we have a, the host wishing to transmit a packet. And as I mentioned, it would go through message processing first, but the result of message processing would be packets at most one maximum transmission unit in size, leaving the message processing part of the architecture and then entering what we see here are the four programmable blocks, main parser, pre-control, main control, and main deparser in green. 
And then there are all the other fixed function blocks, which are similar to things like the traffic manager and the switch. The sets of queues and these externs are the fixed function blocks that would not be P4 programmable. So the parser and main control and main D parser are very similar to what you'd find in ingress or egress in an architecture like PSA or TNA. Uh, the pre-control is a little bit different and is focused on IPsec decryption, and I'll talk more about that later. So we'll focus on the main parser, main control, and main D parser uh, behavior here. So the packet would come in, be parsed first. Uh, when it reaches the main control, as it is in a switch architecture, the main control is where most of your uh, packet processing functionality lies after the packet is parsed. Whatever tables you want to apply, external calls you want to make. And in this case, some one or more tables would set the uh, output port of the packet to be one of your ethernet ports, such that when, and this would be a standard metadata field, and when the main control is finished and main D parser is finished, then the architecture will pass the packet through to that ethernet port. If instead a packet arrived from the network, it would go through these same four programmable blocks, but it would be marked differently. There's a standard metadata direction field defined in PNA that would be marked differently as this packet being net to host as opposed to host to net. And so throughout the main parser and main control, you're allowed, you're not required to, but you're allowed to use that direction metadata to process the packet perhaps differently uh, in the two different directions of, of traffic flow. During the main control, you would uh, direct the packet to a V port. This is a, like an Ethernet port, but is, it indicates not only which host the packet should go to, but potentially also one of several, many queues that could be configured going to the same host. And then the packet will leave, after leaving the main departure, will be will go to that host and that V port. We can also combine together uh, other traffic flows that are commonly used in NICs. So for example, a packet arriving from a port, an Ethernet port here, would be directed during the main control, can, instead of being directed to a V port, can be directed to another, either the same Ethernet port it came in on or a different Ethernet port if the NIC has more than one. So in this example, we see that the blue packet coming in from the network when it reaches the main control is directed to another Ethernet port. And so it leaves the main parser, will go into one of the hosts where it will then loop back because it was destined to an Ethernet port and become now a host to network packet. Uh, so it's the same, the red packet is the same as the blue packet, just after it's reached that host, it becomes a net to host packet. I'm sorry, excuse me, a host to net packet, which will go through these four programmable blocks again. And it will, unless you override it, keep that, remember that same Ethernet port that you assigned as the destination earlier and go out at that Ethernet port. Similarly, if you want uh, a VM to VM or host to host packet, it would start in the host, go through the four programmable blocks during the main control. You can direct the packet to another V port instead of an Ethernet port. And then it will turn around and loop back near the network ports, not going out the network, but looping back there and come back as a network to host packet through the four program blocks again. And again, if you don't override the destination again on the second time through the main control, the packet will then go to that V port and enter one of the hosts. So let's talk about TCP connection tracking as an example here of a feature that we want to enable. So let's imagine that the application on the host has opened up a TCP socket as a client and the kernel has created a TCP SYN packet to be sent out to another host, the server of the TCP socket. So the TCP SYN packet comes through and goes through the same four programmable blocks. And in the main control here, we would create a connection tracking table. An example key for such a table would include the five tuple, IP source and destination address, the protocol, the TCP source and destination port. We would all exact match. We would apply that table, so we'd search for that five tuple value, and if this was the first time those five values, we didn't have an entry to the table, typically when you create a new TCP connection, we'll get a miss. In the default miss action for this table, this connection tracking table, there'll be a new extern function add an entry that will actually, in the data plane, without requiring the control plane to do anything, the data plane will create a new table entry that matches this five tuple. Uh, and in this case, the action will be to permit the packet not drop it, and the packet will then go out to the Ethernet port uh, directed by some other tables action, not the connection tracking table necessarily. It could be, but it could also be typically be a different table. So now 
the control plane, we, the, the, the intent is that the data plane should be able to support a very high rate of adding new entries to such a table in the data plane, and the control plane is not burdened with each addition. Later, when the server replies with a SYN ACK packet, it will come in from the network, will go through our programmable blocks again, and when it reaches the main control, we will look up the same named table connection tracking will be the same physical table in the hardware in a, in a typical implementation will be the same physical table, the same bits in hardware as the one we accessed when the TCP SYN packet earlier went out and added a new entry. So when we look it up this time, the source and destination address, well, the source address will now be that of the server, not our local uh, application. And it, the destination address and source address will be swapped from the TCP SYN packet that went out earlier, as well as the source and destination port. So in this case, our P4 code will be directed to swap the packet's IP source and destination address and swap its TCP source and destination port when it's constructing the lookup key for the connection tracking table. So when our TCP SYN packet came through earlier and added the entry, now that we've swapped these and constructed the key, we will find a match. And therefore, we will write the code to say, don't drop this packet, allow it through, and it will go on through to the host. Uh, if a different TCP SYN packet came in with a different five tuple that was for which we never sent out a TCP SYN packet earlier, it will get a miss and we can direct the packet to be dropped. So these are example actions that I've given permitting and dropping uh, as usual in the actions. We can direct whatever we choose that we want for the application that we want um, that can be done with different actions. So since we can uh, add entries at pretty high rate here, um, how can we get rid of these entries? So we typically want, in a table like this, in a feature like this, we want to age out old entries that haven't been used in a while. There's an existing option for idle timeout in uh, TNA and PSA architectures uh, called idle timeout. And basically for each entry, we keep an age, a, a time, uh, approximate time since the entry was last matched. And whenever that time reaches a configured timeout value, the control plane is notified with a message. And the control plane is solely responsible for deleting the entries in such a table. Um, so the, uh, now for the TCP connection tracking example, we can imagine if entries are being added in the data plane at a high rate, we might want to remove them at a high rate as well without bothering the control plane. So that's a new option we're proposing and adding for PNA is an option to similarly still have entry ages maintained per entry in the data plane, but to also delete entries automatically in the data plane when they reach their configured timeout value without requiring the control plane to be involved at all. So IPsec decryption. Now we'll finally talk about this pre-control block that you may have been wondering about. So a packet comes in from the network. It's been IPsec encrypted uh, its entire payload, at the other end, the other endpoint that sent it to us. We'll come into the main parser. We'll see that there's a encapsulation security payload or ESP header in the packet. And the pre-control will be written to say, ah, there's an ESP header that's valid in this packet. And then it can do one or more table lookups to determine whether there is a security association that's been established by a control plane software earlier. So for example, it might look up the source and destination address, IP addresses of the packet, and uh, an ESP um, SPI field that's in the ESP header, and determine from that table lookup, yes, this is a tunnel that's been set up before, or no, it's not. In this case, we assume it is, so we make the decision in the pre-control block to say, yes, we want to decrypt the packet. Here's the security association I determined from the my look table lookups. In this case, we'll bypass the main control and main deparser, not execute them at all, and we'll go on this recirculation path shown here to this net to host inline X term, whose primary example here is the, the function of decrypting the payload and doing any header modifications required by the IPsec standards, for example, removing IPsec uh, tunnel mode headers. So now that we've done that, the packet will then come back to the main parser and we'll reparse the packet. This is important because after decrypting the payload, the beginning of that payload could very well include and often does include headers that were sent by the original sender and became encrypted in the pay as part of the payload. And so now we want to be able to parse those headers to decide how to, where the package should go next. After that, we have our usual flow of uh, main control and main deparser in this example showing it going to one of the hosts. For IPsec encryption, that's typically done in the transmit direction from the host. So an unencrypted packet comes in from the host and it reaches the main control and we have some table that decides, yes, I want to encrypt this packet for whatever 
via, via whatever table lookups and actions you want to use to determine that. The PNA architecture will define standard metadata fields that indicate uh, will be outputs from the main control and will pass through to the host net inline extern, indicating that it should, instead of its normal pass this through, packet through unmodified, it will see these standard metadata fields saying this packet needs to be encrypted. Here's a security association. It will look up its uh, encryption key and encrypt the payload and do any necessary header modifications. And then the packet uh, typically will go out an Ethernet port, but you still have the option to loop it back near the Ethernet ports, as we showed for host host packets if you wish to. What stays the same? Does anything stay the same in the PNA architecture? Well, quite a lot, in fact. Um, I mean, obviously the P4 language is the same that we're basing this on, but in the portable switch architecture specification, PSA, many externs are defined for common functions such as counters, meters, registers, and others shown here that you're uh, familiar with if you've done any kind of P4 programming on most architectures. And rather than defining those from scratch for PNA, uh, we expect most or all of those to be used unmodified. So uh, there was a proposal recently because we're planning to use these unmodified to separate those extern definitions out of the PSA specification and put them into a P4 standard library. And then the, both the PSA and PNA definitions would refer to this P4 standard library of externs. If you're interested in that topic, uh, join the P4 Arch email list and we sh you should soon see invitations for meetings discussing the P4 standard library proposed, uh, as well as a proposed library of standard uh, P4 header definitions for things like Ethernet, IP, TCP, UDP, et cetera. Uh, something that could have been a while ago, but now, we're, now we have some people interested in, in pushing that forward and, and making that uh, happen. Uh, there's also announcements there of some PSA implementation status meetings in case you're interested. So we're now releasing in May uh, version 0 0.5 of the PNA specification. This is still definitely a work in progress. There's plenty to do and we'll continue to have meetings of the, of the architecture working group to finish the details of packet processing, as well as to uh, work through the definitions of how message processing works. And I expect that will take months of work. And so we're targeting for the end of 21, a version 1.0 release of the PNA specification that should describe both of these things, packet processing and message processing. If you're interested in helping, there's the public repository for the PNA specification. And you're free to create issues there, questions. Um, the P4Arch email list is also a good place to ask questions about it, uh, make comments. And uh, so that's pretty much the, and yeah, feel free to get involved, ask questions about it. Um, and, and we welcome comments and, and people writing sample programs, especially and, and finding issues. I'd like to thank the working group members uh, shown here including my co-chair Gordon Brebner. We've been you know, lots of good people making very good suggestions and improvements and pointing out issues with earlier drafts of the specification. And I think it's a lot better for their, their efforts. So thank you. Bye-bye.